My name's Simon Noble. I'm a clinical professor in palliative medicine and supportive medicine at Cardiff University. My, um, my clinical practice is based in Newport, but over the last four years I've set up a cancer-associated thrombosis service. So we see about 300, 350 new CAT patients a year. And, you know, one thing that you learn is what a different beast it is. About 70% of the patients, I would say, are fairly straightforward using the current evidence base we have. But that means there's, there's 30, 20 to 30% of patients we have to, to manage outside of where the guidelines and the evidence are. So I'm going to talk to you today about a slightly different approach, and I'm going to talk to you about clinical decision-making. Because actually there are times when you don't have the randomized control trials to tell us what we're supposed to be doing. And so therefore, one size cannot fit all. And we're now in an era where chemotherapy is being made, decisions are being made on the basis of molecular markers. One particular tumor may have different mutations and that will target which anti-cancer therapy we use. We know that how breast cancer behaves with respect to thrombosis is different to, say, pancreatic cancer. So the idea that we have this one-size-fits-all approach just doesn't sit comfortably with me. Now, this is a pooled analysis, sorry, this is a subgroup analysis of the Einstein um, DVT and PE studies. Don't worry if you can't read that, I'll summarize. And the reason I'm putting this up is because as far as I believe, and from all the guidelines you see, the management of cancer-associated thrombosis should be low molecular weight heparin initially for three to six months. We now have the DOACs, the direct acting oral anticoagulants, and they have been trialed and licensed for the treatment of DVT and PE. They have been shown to be non-inferior to warfarin and in certain aspects superior. So in the non-cancer population, they have had a massive and positive impact on the treatment of VTE. But does that mean we can use them in cancer patients? Now I would argue, just because something is as good as warfarin, does not mean, we know warfarin isn't as good as low molecular weight heparin in cancer-associated thrombosis, so you can't suddenly infer we use the DOACs. And then this paper came, up, came out, which, if we look, you've actually got pretty good numbers. You know, you've got large numbers here, 354, 301. And what it's basically showing you is that patients who receive rivaroxaban Rate of VTE recurrence, 5%, compared to 7% in the warfarin arm. And on the basis of that study, I started getting patients referred to me who had been started on rivaroxaban, and the clinicians were saying, look, it works, you know, this study shows it. But you've got to think about how that person made that decision. And there's something called selection bias and recall bias, and that tends to be, excuse me, Mr. Midgey, where are you going? where we actually choose the data that supports our beliefs. Now, the authors of this study made a very measured conclusion. They did not say this should be used first line in the treatment of cancer-associated thrombosis, but they said in patients where low molecular weight heparin is not possible, if you are considering either warfarin or a DOAC, you could consider this DOAC here. But actually, as I said, does one size fit all? This is me and my dear mum. She passed away a few years ago. What I loved about mum, apart from the fact she was a great mother, was that it didn't matter what you achieve, she's never kind of, she never lets your feet kind of leave the ground. So when my wife and I came back from climbing Kilimanjaro, feeling very proud, hi mum, Mel and I climb Killy. Oh, well, that's nice, yeah. Your Auntie Jean and I did that last week. Which, first of all, I don't believe she did, because Auntie Jean has got such a dodgy hip. 
But here she is where she came to visit the house once. And, you know, does one size fit all? Well, with the hat, yeah, the same size works absolutely beautifully. So certain aspects, one size does fit all. But I really don't think those tops are going to be interchangeable. And I think we have to remember the individuality of patients, both biologically and emotionally, philosophically, spiritually. So I believe that the management of cancer-associated thrombosis should be guided by the best evidence available. Our patients deserve that. I find it bonkers that you're not going to be able to prescribe a chemo agent for a particular indication unless it has been trialled in that specific area. And yet, once we get to six months of anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin, there have been no successfully recruited studies of what to do beyond six months, and yet it's a question we have all the time. We have a speaker um, this morning who's going to be addressing that. And when we don't have the data, how do we decide what to do? And I would suggest we need to understand as much as we can. Let's understand the pathophysiology of cancer-associated thrombosis. Let's understand how that cancer works. How thrombogenic is it? How thrombogenic are the chemo agents they're receiving? What are the risks of bleeding of that tumour and those agents we're using? Are there drug-drug interactions? And all of that then needs to be guided by patient views. Now, I'd be very clear here, patients do need to be involved in our decision-making, but not to the point where we're going, what do you want to do? Patients place a large amount of reliance on our views. They come to us as clinicians, as experts, for our expert opinion. And yes, we should be able to discuss all the options, but sometimes they may need direction. We know that cancer-associated thrombosis, 53% of people who get a cancer-associated thrombosis do so in the first three months of their cancer diagnosis. I suspect mainly because that's when they have further risk factors such as chemotherapy. So these guys have already had one threat to life, which is the cancer. They're just getting their heads around that when they have another threat to life, which is thrombosis. So psychologically, that is a lot to take on, and they're going to need help with deciding. How many of you have read Donald Chern's book, Educating the Reflective Practitioner? Well, you are so lucky, because that's two weeks of your life I will never get back. <laughs> it is the dullest book I've ever read. did it as part of my medical, um, uh, my medical education thesis. But he talks about this thing, the swamp. And you've got people who are on the clifftop, and everything they see is clear. That is where we have randomised control trials, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Everything is, is answered. And for them, these guys can see very clearly. There's defined problems, predictable outcomes, predictable goals. And then there's the real world, where we often find ourselves, which is the swamp, where we have zones of indeterminate practice but we don't actually know what we should be doing, or there's not the same robust data. So, you know, that person who has had a saddle embolus, who has got 42 platelets, um, who is needle phobic and weighs 40 kilos, you know, just pile on, pile on, and, and a bleeding, bleeding point as well. You know, what do you do there? Because none of those guys got into the RCTs. And it's always very important to look at the RCTs to see what data it covers, what patients it covers and what it doesn't. That's the swamp. That is where you don't actually have a clear answer. And that's where Schoen says artistry is needed. Now, I'm not saying, you know, kind of, ah, whatever, that looks nice. I'm saying you've got to think it through. And you've got to accept the uncertainties, but use the best resources available to make those decisions. Now, that's where reflection comes in. I know for those of you who have to revalidate, you have to write your reflective portfolios, and you think, what is this? This is just kind of stating the bleeding obvious. But it's actually looking back at your own experiences. Can you gain something from there? Are there resources you can look at? Expert opinion, talking to colleagues. But the important thing here is you can't say, well, there's no evidence. So 
so we don't do anything because you have a patient there who is ill you've got to make a decision so how do we make decisions normally well these are the three factors involved in decision making number one there's the evidence when you've got high quality evidence it's a lot easier to make those decisions the next thing we have patient preference and that will have an influence to varying degrees certainly when we're looking at different cancer treatments the side effect profile the likelihood of it helping will be put to the patient there are decision making tools that are developed for this as well and then finally there's something called heuristics heuristics anyone familiar with heuristics great you're learning something today either that or I'm gonna bore you to death Heuristics are basically the rules of thumb which help us make decisions. It's that kind of sixth sense. What is it? Why is this fly following me around? Maybe I should have washed this morning. These are the rules of thumb, the mental shortcuts we make. And they can actually guide us because they are our experiences, our ongoing knowledge, how we do it. But they can be prone to bias. I remember when I did my first house job, my surgeon consultant saw me on day one and said, just so you know, if you ever prescribe fruzamide, I'll kill you, not I'll kill you, I'll sack you. Why is that? You know, because there's an RCT on fruzamide use and it's a dangerous drug? No, 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 no. He had one bad experience with it. When a patient who was oliguric was given fruzamide, more fruzamide, fruzamide, um, died of renal failure. That one experience he anchored onto and therefore did not have an appropriate view of the situation. Availability is the ease with which a particular view or event is brought to mind. So it's often the more drastic events that happen. So if I were to be thinking, let's say, I'm an orthopaedic surgeon and I use an anticoagulant as prophylaxis and that patient gets a wound infection. That, because that patient is coming back to see me over and over again with complications, is what springs to mind more readily than the thousand patients who <coughs> had no post-operative complications. So there's a sort of bias there in where my opinions come from. Representativeness is often when we just categorise things. And we tend to focus on particular characteristics, but not the others. We don't see the whole picture. So, for example, with this study, what's very interesting about it is people are fixing on there is a difference in the outcomes between the rivaroxaban arm in the cancer patients and the, non in the, and the warfarin arm. But what it's not doing is looking at the whole picture. Because when I saw this, I was very excited... But then, and then when we look at all the DOACs in a meta-analysis, look at this, pulled instance rates of VTE for DOACs versus vitamin Ks, 4.1% for DOACs, 6.1% for vitamin K antagonists. That's good, isn't it? It looks pretty convincing. So now should we be using DOACs first line? You could argue, well, injections versus tablets, Maybe, you know, even if we, we haven't done them head-to-head -head against low molecular weight heparin, patients may prefer the trade-off of a tablet to an injection. But you've got to look at other things. You've got to look at the whole system, um, the whole situation. Because what struck me when I saw this was 6.1% recurrence rate for v, in VKAs. That's pretty low compared to the other studies looking at low molecular weight heparin versus warfarin. The landmark study, the CLOCK trial, the VT recurrence rate in warfarin was 16%. The VT recurrence rate on low molecular weight heparin was 8%. So, according to this, all these studies, warfarin was better than low molecular weight heparin according to those studies. Doesn't make sense, does it? You know, you look at these other studies, the rates of recurrent VTE in warfarin were much higher. 
So what is different here? So instead of going straight in on tablets are going to be better, I must go for those. Well, let's just have a look. And this is just one aspect which is important to note. If you look at the proportion of patients in the low molecular weight heparin, heparin studies who had metastatic disease, and we know, as Lord Kekar has shown us, the presence of metastatic disease is a significant risk factor for VTE. And that one risk factor, you can see in the CLOT study, you're talking about three times as you know, many risk factors in these patients. The next one would be chemotherapy. And likewise, in those low molecular weight heparin studies, we're talking about 50% of patients were receiving chemotherapy, an independent risk factor. Whilst in the DOAC studies, we were looking at much lower levels, about 20% again. So what we're seeing here is, yes, in this group of patients, in this study, you are having fewer rates of VTE. But this patient population is a significantly healthier one than those who were in the other cancer studies. And the authors quite correctly pointed out, you know, in a representative population, so in the patients with early stage cancer, who are not going to be having the ongoing chemotherapy, there's a signal there that these seem to be all right but it doesn't tell us we can use them for everyone. If you think about it, I said CLOT study covers 70% of the population. There's 30% who are outside of the inclusion criteria or have complications that aren't managed through the CLOT regime. This is an even less representative group of all the patients we see out there. <coughs> Then there's anchoring and adjustment. And basically, when we make a quick decision and estimate a number, we often kind of anchor it to a previously given estimate, regardless of how good it is. So you hear one false thing early on, you keep going back to that. OK, this is, many of you have seen this comedy slide before. Um, this was me at the Vegas, um, in Vegas um, for my stag. And I show this because it illustrates a point I want to make. You cannot put breast cancer and metastatic pancreatic cancer in the same pot when you're talking about cancer-associated thrombosis. When Lord Kekar was talking about the Save Onco study, one thing that's important to note that was that that population was highly heterogeneous. You had breast cancer patients in there, colorectal cancer patients, pancreatic cancer patients receiving chemo. You saw from those slides the thrombogenicity of breast cancer is much lower than the thrombogenicity of pancreatic cancer. The chemo regimes differ. The rate of VTE differs. So you put them all in together and just call it cancer. We wouldn't do that if we were giving a chemo agent, would we? You know, you need to be, and what's happening now is there are going to be studies looking at individual tumour types. So as much as you have cancer, and you wouldn't look at cancer as one single entity, you look at the different tumour types, chemo regimes, you wouldn't have one Elvis either. Okay? You can't have a one-size-fits-all regime. This is a one-size-fits-all Elvis outfit. <laughs> and you can see with Johnny Burton, tall guy, doesn't fit him. Here's my elder brother, Roy. He's scraping his flares on the floor. As a kid, he was investigating. We thought he was a midget. He used to get really cross. Girls would pick him up and try and put him in a pram. Um, and then here you got me. I had to have my own suit because I couldn't fit in that one. And so in the same way that you, you've got different cancers, here's Elvis before he went to the war, Elvis for his Vegas comeback, and Elvis five minutes before he died on the toilet. <laughs> But I hope it makes the point that one size does not fit all, and we need to be prepared to individualize. So where are the areas of uncertainty, how, and how do we approach heuristics, clinical decision-making? Well, anticoagulation beyond six months in patients with active cancer, 
there's going to be a talk coming up, and that, you know, that's a very important area. We're seeing this a lot. The natural history of cancer is changing. People are living longer with metastatic disease. People having ongoing treatments. Populations excluded from those trials, the extremes of body weight. I'm seeing a lot of patients who are getting recurrent clots um, who are, you know, over 100 kilos because the weight-adjusted dose of, in our, where we use it's delta parin, you know, top level is 18,000. That doesn't cover everyone. Patients with brain mets, they weren't in the studies. Those who've got bleeding, bleeding risk. Those with poor prognosis. <coughs> you know, a criteria to get into studies is a prognosis of more than three months. I promise you, people with less than three months to live get clots too. But then the question is, is what is, you know, how's the best way to manage them? Poor performance status. Those who weren't well enough to come into clinic to be evaluated. And also, which drug do we use for those situations? So I would say that when you're in the swamp, appreciate the data in the less representative population. So, you know, look at the data from clots. That tells you something. It tells you a lot. Look at the data from CATCH, a more modern study looking at tinzaparin. Once again, shows similar data. Appreciate the heterogeneity of cancer, how different cancers behave differently. And then also, when you understand this, and if there's a degree of uncertainty, discuss that with the patient so they can make an informed decision. So I would say that when you make decisions, initial treatment of cancer-associated thrombosis, I would think is pretty clear. We've got excellent, high-quality data there, which shows, you know, that, and that is going to overarch what we do. I would say that this is where you have to explain it to the patients, because patients will go, can't I have a tablet? And yes, they could have a tablet, but currently the data says the injection works better. And cancer patients with thrombosis see themselves as cancer patients first and foremost. They wouldn't ask for the second best chemo. They wouldn't ask for the second best available anticoagulant, if you put it to them that way. Patient preference does come into it. There are some who do not tolerate the injections. But there are important things you can do to facilitate that. Education, site rotation, warning them that they will get a, if they get a bruise, they may get a lump under the skin as well. You must warn them of that, because I promise you a cancer patient with a lump under the skin thinks they have metastases until proven otherwise. A lot of people very distressed because they have a lump, they, they didn't know that this was part of their treatment. So here we've got the strong evidence, we've got the clot study, shows a 52% relative risk reduction in recurrent clots. We have meta-analysis, which shows all the agents have been evaluated. The largest two studies were CATCH, with tinzaparin, and with um, clot, with daltaparin. Treatment beyond six months, you're going to be having a whole talk on this. But I would say, I think the kind of where we're at is there's a lot of evidence what to do before six months. So six months and one day. You probably know what to do. Six months, two days, yeah. But it's what do you do ongoing? I think there's a big issue of patient preference here. And there is also heuristics as to what you know about the various things. Now, I don't want to preempt my colleagues' talk on this. But when we make a decision, I just think this is a nice clinical decision guide. And this was illustrated by Jeff Swicker. Because what I like about it is, number one, it puts patient preference. It talks about different things which may influence veering towards stopping or continuing anticoagulation. But I'm not going to talk any more on that because there's a whole talk on it. What do you do when someone has recurrent VTE management? Well, then, you know, the data, once again, is pretty small. You know, there's been some case series. There's opinion. You're going to have to use our understanding of anticoagulation, how the drugs work, how clots work, how clots form, how clots resorb in the, in the background of other competing factors. End of life, there's no evidence out there. There's hardly any evidence. We just have what happens early on. So once again there, it's going to be, you know, kind of looking at things beyond just the data. Finally, 
just want to add one more thing here, and this is my last slide. Be very careful of thinking you understand your patient or you know what your patient thinks. Um, there are a lot of colleagues who will say, you know, I believe the DOAX work as well as low molecular weight heparin. Um, or even if they are not going to be shown to be as good, I actually think that slight reduction in efficacy, if there is one, is an acceptable trade-off so someone doesn't have to have injections. And that sounds, you know, I think it's a reasonable thing to say is, you know, would a person, you know, prefer to have intervention B, which is 2% less good than intervention A, because that one's a tablet and intervention A is an injection. Would you be prepared to have a less efficacious drug which is more convenient to take? Well, we asked patients. Myself, Anthony Maravais, and a few of us, there was some discrete choice experiments where you give different scenarios as to what trade-off they would accept. But part of this, they were asked, what are the most important characteristics of your anticoagulant? And they had to rank them. Number one, they want a drug which does not interfere with their cancer treatment. Because as I said, they see themselves as cancer patients first, cancer-associated thrombosis patients second. They do not want their cancer treatment interrupted. Number two, they want a drug that works. Efficacy is the next thing that's most important. Number three, they want it to be safe. Bleeding, they want the lowest bleeding rate. Then. Number four was I'd prefer a tablet to an injection. And the way I interpret that is that patients see efficacy, safety, and non-interference in their cancer treatment as the most important. And if those things are met, yeah, they would prefer a tablet. I don't think very few people would always opt for an injection. But they do not want to risk efficacy for that bit of convenience. So that's why it's so important that there are studies ongoing now for all the DOACs for the primary initial treatment of VTE. Head-to-head -head studies, non-inferiority, DOAC versus low molecular weight heparin. It's an exciting time. I sincerely hope we see they work as well. I think it would make life you know, a lot better. But we need to make sure our patients get the best treatment available and are able to help them make those decisions because they rely a lot on us to guide them. So if we're going to guide them, let's make sure we know what we're talking about. Thank you very much.